Yeah, that's fine. I don't know if you can you remember Jenny. Seeing my uh, um, Hello, welcome everyone uh, to the meeting of the AGMA scrutiny. From, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong. Sorry, that's great. Of the Cultural uh, and Social Impact uh, Committee. Can I just remind members to indicate by uh, uh, messaging on the chat? Can I also remind them to put themselves on uh, mute, please? Um, if I can, uh, first of all, uh, ask for if we have any apologies for absence, please. Your legs just wouldn't go. Can I just remind people to put their microphones on mute? We're picking up some uh, background noise. If we could just uh, do that, please, that would be uh, really helpful. Thank you. So can I again invite, please, uh, apologies for absence? Thank you. Hello, is somebody going to give me some apologies? Sorry, we have um, officers from Wigan, Manchester, Thameside, Bury, and Link for Life. We don't actually have any apologies given from members. We haven't received any. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. We move now to item two, which is the appointment of chair and vice chair. Uh, it is that the portfolio lead for culture to be the chair for the Greater Manchester Culture and Social Impact Funds Committee 2020 to 2021. Uh, I there have to uh, invite committee to ask for nominations uh, for the role of vice chair. Um, have we any nominations? I, I personally would like to put forward uh, Councillor Janet Emsley, who has been a great uh, stalwart of this committee. Uh, over the years, and I hope that Janet will accept that. But I have, as of right, got to ask if there are other any nominations. No, there aren't. So thank you, Janet. It looks like you've been successful. Yeah. Lovely. That's great, and great to have you as the as the vice chair. Um, move on to item three, which is to note the membership of the Greater Manchester Culture and Social Impact Fund 2021. Um, we're just asked to note this. If there's no comments on that, we'll, we'll note that and move on. No, that's fine. I have just seen in the chat that um, uh, Liz Patel sends her apologies. So if that can be added uh, to the list, that, that would be great. Uh, we now have moved to uh, item four, which is chair's announcement and urgent business, which I have none. So to item five, which is members code of conduct and annual declaration form. This is just to remind members of their obligation under the GMCA members code of conduct to complete an annual declaration of interest form, uh, which will be published on the GMCA website. So if you could get that back uh, to officers, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, my camera is on. I've just got that on, so I don't know if it's not picking up, but I've got the red box around my around my image, so I don't know if something's going wrong, but my camera it's, is on. It's saying preview isn't available. We'll ask IT to have a look at that. OK, um, well, my camera definitely is uh, on. That would be really yeah. helpful. Um, my camera is on. I've just got that right, on. Right, I'm getting a up, shopping feedback now, but we'll, my, we'll live with that. Around my image, so I don't know if something's going wrong, but my camera is on. Uh, could I just remind everyone to go on mute, please, in case we're getting feedback because everyone is not on mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, moving on to item six, it's to note the committee's terms of reference. Are there any comments on that? No, so, so that is noted. Um, so we move finally into ordinary business and to item seven, which is declarations of interest. Um, are there any declarations of interest uh, from members today? No, that's great. So my to move to item eight is to approve the minutes of the last meeting dated the 18th of September 2019. These have been circulated. Are there any matters arising from those minutes that are not covered in the agenda? No, that's fine. So can I just have a, a nod and a thumbs up, please, uh, for approval on that? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. 
Um, and then finally, we move to uh, not finally, but number nine, we move to the GM Culture Fund 2020 to 2022. And this has been circulated. This is the report that I presented to leaders at GMCA uh, on the 14th of February. It seems an eternity ago that. It seemed an eternity for officers and myself producing that report as well, but finally we did it. Um, it was uh, not without its uh, issues and without its challenges, but I think we reached uh, a really good solution, one which was supported across the board uh, by all members. And it did, um, for culture, uh, see an increase in the amount uh, to the cultural pot. It uh, satisfied many of the requirements that was our ambition, which was to reach out and cover a larger area to benefit organisations across the whole conurbation. So we saw much wider um, uh, uh, a demographic and diversity uh, and also reach of the grant than, than ever before. Um, it recognised um, you know, nationally acclaimed and internationally acclaimed uh, organisations uh, and I feel uh, we got to a place uh, uh, finally uh, which which really led we got the first time we, we managed to support literary organisations lots of really uh, good wins I felt this time so I don't know if the report has been circulated I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions regarding the report happy to uh, to answer that. No, nothing. I'll just give time for people to indicate in case they want. No, that's fine. So that uh, is is noted. Uh, we then move on to item 11, which is activity undertaken since March 2020. And before I bring Marie Claire in, um, I think it would be absolutely remiss of me just to give the background of this, which is one of huge challenge. Um, that, that we face within the cultural sector. Um, and uh, it's one um, that uh, I hope we'll be able as, as a committee to, to delve a little bit deeper into and to analyse and discuss. Uh, clearly the, the money that came, the announcement uh, uh, from government uh, was very welcome, but clearly there are still many issues about if that is to be in any way sustainable moving forward then the, the whole sector does need continued support. So just to give you a little background to that, I'm sure Mary Claire will be going into it myself um, and the mayor have met with, um, I would say nearly 50 cultural organisations and the heads of those uh, in, in a number of meetings, um, really to get the, the background and the feel uh, of the sector and to come up with, with some genuine um, proposals that we can uh, put to uh, to the to the government department um, and uh, th it's been very productive uh, but clearly we will be measured by the outcomes that, that we reach uh, and also I'm sure Mary Claire covered the fantastic uh, stuff that we've actually been able to do during lockdown which is a key part of it as well it's not just the venues it's not just the theatres um, it, it's all those working within the uh, the industry themselves who are freelance and the effects it has uh, on, on all those which are really really key and really important that we address and I really see there's a possibility that GM can lead on this because we we have to present on a number of levels this is not just about the culture because that's what it is but what that culture drives and that drives economic prosperity in the city and the conurbation but it also promotes well-being a tremendous evidence uh, base uh, regarding uh, the uh, impact of well-being on residents that take part in culture. So just to give that backdrop, I'm now going to uh, invite and, and thank as well, I must, the officer team, because uh, Marie Claire, the two Alisons, um, Alison McKenzie Fowler, Alison Gordon, and of course Gareth, the whole team, uh, because uh, they're great to work with. Um, and here's uh, one of the stalwarts who's going to do this presentation, Marie Claire. So over to you. And she's put her makeup on for you, especially. So there you go. Over to you, Marie Claire. Can you see the presentation? Not yet for me. OK, maybe maybe I won't share then. Um, I'll just talk to it if that's OK. Um, 
Yeah, Matt, so it's been... Sorry, um, we're having trouble sending you live. Just bear oh. with us one second. Oh, there we go. I think you're live now, but your picture isn't showing. That's fine. You're live. We'll keep okay. you to see you. Brilliant. Um, I will crack on then. Yeah, it's been um, it's been an interesting seven months now, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically, we announced the portfolio in March. I think the last time we met was in January. Um, so yeah, we announced portfolio in March, and we. I remember in the room at the time we were having conversations with people saying, oh, do you think this is going to be a thing, this COVID? Do you think it's going to be a problem? And little did we know. Um, so I think it was less than a month since we announced the portfolio that we went into lockdown. Um, and one of the first things that we did was we spoke to all of our kind of cultural organisations to find out how they were feeling. Um, and so in the, the presentation here, there's a little bit of background about the kind of value of culture to Greater Manchester in terms of visitors, in terms of GVA, in terms of kind of health, well-being, joy and happiness. And I think that, that throughout all of this, it's been wonderful to see just how well the sector has stepped up, I think, in terms of They've done some really amazing work in terms of that initial response with cultural organisations, um, getting, getting their wardrobe departments to manufacture PPE, um, dropping off um, goods to vulnerable residents. I think it shows just how important and integral they are to our communities, um, which is why it's really, really concerning. Um, what we've got ahead in terms of the, the challenges. Um, I think that that we're cognizant that our sector was one of the first to close and will be one of the last to be able to open properly. So what we've been doing um, is we've been speaking to all of our cultural organisations, but we've widened the net as well. We've been having conversations with Arts Council England. We've been having conversations with DCMS having conversations with Heritage Lottery Fund, we've been um, speaking to a lot of people um, to try and find out what the lay of the land, what people's real concerns are. Um, I think, yeah, I, there is there is so much that we can do within Greater Manchester. I think there are things that the scale of the challenge is too big and we, we need government to help and government to step in and we need that package go to the right people across Greater Manchester. Um, yeah, so if you look at slide five where it talks about the, the impact of lockdown, the numbers are quite scary. Um, we know already that quite a lot of our organisations have entered periods of consultation. Um, redundancies. We know that some redundancies have already happened. We know that regardless of whether organisations are able to access the cultural recovery fund. We know that there are going to be an awful lot of redundancies once furlough ends. Um, we're also concerned about about the freelancers who might not show up on the statistics, who were who are gradually and have gradually been making the decision that a career in creative industries culture um, is no longer sustainable as a freelancer and they will be changing sectors as well. I think we've done what we can to try and mitigate and to try and help. Um, so first, the first thing that we did once lockdown was announced was we, um, we forwarded the first six month payments of all of our grants to organisations without any expectation for delivery. Um, we know that every single organisation did deliver but actually what they needed was breathing space and um, you saw Arts Council and um, other councils who have grant funding to cultural organisations do the same as well. I think it was understood that, that, that we, it would be foolish and unfair to try and hold organisations to the things that they put in their application form 
because they just weren't deliverable. Um, since lockdown, I think in, in July, we had, we've had we um, had hour-long meetings with every single organisation within the portfolio to find out um, how they're doing in terms of organisational health, um, to find out how they're doing um, in terms of programme, to find out how they're doing in terms of whether they're able to open, when they might be able to open, where their kind of concerns lie, um, what they're worried about. Um, and so that first six months payment um, has, I mean, if we were to look just on numbers, I think engagement would be up despite asking for no delivery um, because digital engagement has been so high. So all of the organisations are really kind of grateful for that breathing space. Um, and we're now going to go into kind of the next bit of contract negotiation where we're going to agree revised delivery deliverables from October onwards. So the kind of the um, no expectation of delivery will change um, from October onwards. So the second six months of this funding period, there will be agreed deliverables um, and we'll kind of agree um, what kind of metrics they'll be measured on as well in a way that we just couldn't um, throughout lockdown with so many staff on furlough. Um, Another thing that we did was we launched the COVID commissions. Um, we were very aware through speaking to kind of organisations, but also to artists, that a lot of freelance artists' um, commissions and income just dried up overnight. So we put this out, it was 60 grants of £500 um, to individual artists, to musicians. Um, we had 400 applications i think that shows you the kind of scale of the need out there um the the quality was incredibly high um they're now all available to view on a website which is a really fascinating you get a second it's a really fascinating documentation of those first two three months of lockdown um yeah um we've had national radio play on six music for one of the commissions really kind of um, good feedback. I think it's going to be an interesting thing to look back on in maybe a year's time to see how we were all feeling and what those artistic responses were. Um, another thing that we did was um, working with Sasha Lord, our Nighttime Economy Advisor. We launched United Restream. So one of the main reasons for this was um, to keep people entertained through lockdown. Um, to really push that stay at home message. And I think we had more than 8 million views, um, which is phenomenal in eight weeks. Um, and they were from all over the world. Um, so in terms of that kind of brand, Greater Manchester, um, putting a spotlight on our cultural output, um, I think it was phenomenal. Um, yeah, we've been nominated for awards now. Um, we have, so since we stopped kind of regular programming, we have done a lockdown prom for young people who were unable to attend um, any proms this year. We hosted virtual pride. We have um, a couple more streams coming up this year. We've got um, a Black Lives Matter stream highlighting um, black artists from across Greater Manchester. We've got a really beautiful piece by Manchester Camerata. We've got um, a mental health awareness festival, which has got some really big name artists like Snow Patrol and I'm trying to think who else. Um, but that's going to happen on Mental Health Awareness Day, which is the 10th of October, because I think we're all really kind of aware that people are struggling right now. So as well as entertaining people <laughs> and helping um, organisations to get their cultural output there. We were also raising money and we raised nearly half a million pounds in eight weeks again, which is phenomenal, which has been now is going out to um, organisations within the cultural and nighttime economy. So bars, restaurants, um, freelancers, cultural organisations, music venues in Greater Manchester who have been impacted have been able to bid in for this money um, 
we asked that they they spoke to us in their application about how they would use the funds to become to to put in place sustainable adjustments that would make their business more viable in a kind of COVID world. Um, so yeah, it's it's already having huge impact um, on organisations. Um, we also gave significant money to the Mayor's Charity Towards Homelessness, to Nordoff Robbins, who are a music education therapy charity. Um, also through individual events, we gave money to hospices, we gave money to um, charities that work with young gay people um, who are ex who've been made homeless. We um, gave money to Eat Well, which um, providing meals for um, key workers. So yeah, there was there was an awful lot of kind of good work done through the money that we raised. And then um, finally, we did the creative care packs, and I think we're we're probably up to maybe fifty thousand now. And so we realised that actually there was um, digital engagement was on the rise, but we, there was a huge swathe of our residents who were digitally excluded. Um, so these creative care packs were sent to um, vulnerable young people, to older people. Um, to provide them with something to do when they couldn't access creative content online and they were really re well received it was a wonderful collaboration between cultural organizations in every single one of our districts and also kind of food banks mutual aid groups i think it was a really beautiful example of um how greater manchester came together um i think that that that's kind of what we did and then um the final slide kind of living with covid is 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 what we're thinking at the moment in terms of what the kind of main <laughs> problems and challenges and um ways in which we might mitigate those and i think that moves into the next agenda item which is the cultural recovery plan but i'll stop now and um ask for any comments or questions i think Chair, can I just um, mention, can we have a copy of the slides? I've not been able to access them. Uh, certainly, it did come out in the pack. Um, I apologise if you've, you've had problems, but we can yeah. certainly get those recirculated. Yeah, that would be useful. Out, yeah. yeah, it did come out in the full pack. So, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get those. Uh, okay. um, and certainly, <clears throat> if others could indicate, um, we might just do another blanket to send out. But uh, but I think I think hopefully the majority of you did get the pack. Uh, are there any more questions uh, for for Marie Claire on on the piece? Anything to do with the activity that's been going on, or any activity that you would have liked to have seen, or anything that you'd like to comment on, saying how fantastic it was, or um, anything at all? No. Well, I Yes, yes, sorry, yes. See, I forgot. Um, yes, please come yeah. in, yes. Yeah, this is uh, Jane from Berry. Um, thank you very, very much. I do, they do have the slides, so I have been able to follow it. Um, I guess all I'm, I'm keen to check is, um, I'm aware of some of the activities that have been mentioned and, and some of the funding um, in terms of my own authority, but um, it would be really useful if we can be kept up to date as, as, uh, about all the measures planned. For example, um, in Bury, we have our own um, ideas about Mental Health Day uh, because we want to link our cultural recovery with our general, our corporate recovery for COVID, um, and also Black Lives Matters. But we'd be really happy to coordinate and to work across GM and neighbouring authorities on that so it's really just um some of the things I'd, i wasn't aware of that have been mentioned and it would be good to um know about those please i think you raise a really valid point jen i think we, we, we we're always striving to get the communication um as good as it possibly can be and when when decisions uh, on various things and reports go through uh, the GMCA at leader level and um, sometimes getting that filtered through all the systems is is harder than one would imagine but I don't know if you want to comment on that Mary Claire but it's something we are really striving to get correct and I think with the more 
joined up we get regarding the cultural offer, um, the better we can do. Then we don't get duplication and we don't and uh, we can really benefit. And the United we, we stream, which I accept as well in, in some boroughs where there was a, you know, trying to push it on, on social media as such in uh, was was a lot more apparent in some areas than others. Um, and I think we have to be get our timings correct and, and prepare for this so that we're we're ahead of the game in and try to be ahead of the game in, in all parts of the conurbation. But Mary Claire, do you just want to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that yeah, it was it was a very very interesting time um, where we moved into kind of delivery mode, almost, which is something that we as the CA kind of don't normally do. We're not normally deliverers, and I think that that I mean, we were while we were doing that kind of delivery, we weren't communicating. Um, I think that now we've possibly moved back into what is the kind of normal CA-ish, as normal as we can be. And, and hopefully that will mean that the regular communication will become better, that we will be able to keep people up to date, that we will be able to be um, more kind of consultative than possibly we were when we, we, we just had to react quite quickly. And I think that was the same across the board, across all portfolio areas where, um, yeah, there was a lot of reacting um, and not an awful lot of kind of communication and consultation. And I think that um, we're hopefully getting back to, to being a bit more um, joined up about the whole thing. Thank you. So if there's no more um, questions on that, um, we'll move to um, item 12, uh, which is the GM Culture Recovery Plan. And apologies for those of you that have not had the uh, the pack, but this uh, is in that uh, was circulated. Um, and if you look within your um, pack, those of you that, that have got it to hand, uh, the main uh, points come at 3.3 3, uh, in the report in, in terms of the um, uh, the way forward. Uh, we've talked a lot about the backdrop um, uh, and, and the implications of that. Um, so hopefully you've got those before you. Um, the challenge for us is, of course, that uh, we move to a situation where the, the money from government uh, will probably support less than half of uh, those organisations that are actually known to us. Um, and uh, clearly there are those that are uh, delivering some, some great work, uh, but that one are not necessarily on the Arts Council radar or for whatever reason, um, don't just uh, fit those criteria. So there are lots of lists uh, of measures uh, within this report. Uh, that we highlight and I'm just going to go through uh, just just a few of them briefly for those of you that don't have um, it before you and it's basically including priorities which is um, and lobbying for supporting an extension of furlough VAT measures, broadening of exhibition tax relief, uh, particular focus on uh, freelancer support nationally. Um, it's supporting GM culture portfolio organisations are working with them to support the wider GM cultural sector. It's working with GMCA skills and work teams to develop a package of support and training for those who do need to leave uh, the cultural sector. Um, developing a legacy of United Restream. So out of you know some positive things that have actually happened out of the crisis, we have this uh, de development of this fantastic um, platform, as it were, for uh, performers, which we, we, we do, which we don't want to lose. Uh, continuation of delivery of the Great Place project, um, encouraging Greater Manchester Local Authority to continue their support and investment in culture in the localities. We have to all be honest that we're we are facing some tremendous challenges. Uh, delighted to hear what uh, Jane said from Berry about that culture uh, is connected with recovery. And I think we have, you know, this is a lot that we can uh, do within our own local authorities uh, to make sure that that connection is made. I know in Bolton, we have turned our um, 
high streets, uh, uh, high, uh, sorry, uh, towns funding uh, money. I know all boroughs have not been um, uh, applicable to saying it's just three within GM, uh, but we have really given a cultural uh, feel to that uh, and linking cultural activities with, with that investment. So it's not easy when there's challenges on, on uh, finance in all departments, but there is a real danger that culture could be left behind and we must really fight for the benefits that culture brings uh, to, to residents of our boroughs. Um, encouraging, uh, sorry, programming activity to animate the town city centre and provide opportunity for artists and those who work on cultural project, uh, in the cultural project economy. Uh, development of a communication and advocacy campaign to support the sector in Greater Manchester, including rollout of the GM culture narrative developed earlier this year. Uh, publication of the GM heritage topic paper, feeding in where appropriate to GM uh, spatial framework plans uh, and commission GM Mills Research Programme with Historic England. So I think we obviously through our libraries and museums, this is another key aspect. We probably concentrate a little bit in this meeting about, you know, um, the, the cultural venues and the performance aspect, but the libraries and museums play a, a key part in this and heritage in particular and how we um, how, how um, towns relate to that heritage, celebrate that heritage. So I think that whole cultural piece we, we want to develop and uh, and, and uh, prioritise. Um, uh, working with the local creative education partnerships across the GM to coordinate a community at the cultural offer for young people across GM. Another key factor for us is to um, you know, accept that a lot of our demographic that actually access culture, um, it varies tremendously throughout, throughout the sector, but on the whole it is a, a higher demographic and older demographic. We need to, to reach out to, to young people and actually find out what culture means to them and how we can uh, reach and work on that as we as we uh, come out of the uh, pandemic or work living with the pandemic. Explore the potential of linking cultural investment and support to social value um, uh, clause, clause in public sector procurement contracts. That's uh, key as well. Further explore the potential development of creative improvement districts. Develop recommendations of the GM music review uh, and support the development of the GM nighttime economy recovery plan. So, those are up to now the, the main uh, thrusts of uh, the recommendations moving forward. Um, I don't know if um, either Alison or, or, or Mary want to come in on that again. I Claire want to come in on that again, but is there anything? Uh, Alison, are you indicating there? No, no, I think we're just moving your mouse. There you go. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so is I'll, anyone, I'll, go on Mary, Claire. I'll just say something. Um, so we are further along than we were when these papers um, were sent. So we now have a draft plan. It's not to change from that, but it'd be really great um, to get members thoughts on what those priorities are looking like, because we do have a short time to um, amend before it kind of goes into the system, goes to wider leadership team and then to leaders and then to the CA. So if there, if there are any comments on um, the proposed measures that we're going to take, um, please do let us know because there is still opportunity to feed in and shape. Thank you. So we've got some questions coming in. So can I go to um, Councillor Kate Butler, please, first? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've, I've got a very dodgy connection at the moment, so I'm hoping it, 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 it lasts long enough for my, for my question. Um, I think I'd, I'd just like to get some, and not, not right, right now, but just to get um, some idea of the, the scale of the issues. So maybe just some numbers of um, the, 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 the freelancers and the behind the scenes, the back of house and, and, and front of house, just the numbers of people who um, might not have a job to go back to um, and also um, the, the numbers and, and types of, of organisations that look like um, they, they might ha have to close just to to kind of like, like I say, just to get a feel for the scale of the 
issue and um, the impact mm -hmm. that GM can make, um, which I know that we'll do a, a, a everything we can as GM and in our in, in individual boroughs, but we won't be able to do everything. So just to get an idea, the scale of the problem and then the impact that we collectively and individually might be able to have on on that. Uh, thanks Kate for that. Um, I mean uh, from the talks that, that we've had uh, with many of the organisations, I mean it, first of all I need to point out it's it's a tremendously complex and mixed picture across the sector um, but a lot of what they are saying to us is that they can manage uh, this financial year, uh, but the trouble, the main trouble happens in the next financial year. And of course, we can't predict what is going to happen with this virus, but it doesn't really look like anytime soon um, that venues are going to open in any kind of normality. And the reality is that socially distanced audiences don't work financially for many, many venues. So that is why the first priority really for us is to, is to lobby that this, this sector is, is different to every other sector. And if we value this sector, we, we really do need to, to fight for it and fight for more money. Otherwise, that 1.5 billion has just been poured down the drain because it has not been in any way sustainable. So that's the message. I'm going to bring in Mary, Mary Claire as well, but that is the picture. Every place is different. Um, uh, you know, we, we've spoken, for example, to, to just venues, you know, rather than people that have like uh, touring theatres or, or resident theatre companies and things like that. Um, libraries and museums uh, are, are completely different. I know many of us have got our libraries and museums uh, up and running. Many in many boroughs are working um, at have, have opened despite the fact they are not able to bring in uh, the funding from that that they could that makes them the model supports them. So they're doing it actually at a loss at the moment. So it's a very mixed picture. Marie Claire, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that that it's really, really hard to tell, especially now we've got the Cultural Recovery Fund open. Um, I think that when we start to get notification of who has got um, and who hasn't got, I think that's when we'll know where the, you know, so, so in terms of individual organisations, we're pretty, most organisations have started redundancy um, consultation already. Um, in terms of the scale of the picture, it's really, really hard. Um, there's national research, um, and I think we contributed towards the Oxford Economics work, but they, when they went down to a more granular level, um, the data didn't really stack up in any kind of meaningful way. I think they went down to the Northwest, um, not to Greater Manchester, so any kind of borough level picture or any kind of even greater Manchester is really tricky to get. I think we do know that so there's a kind of cliff edge um, for individuals in at the end of October and we will know that um, that will come through labour market statistics and I think there is a way that once that has happened we will be able to retrospectively look um, at how many people have lost their jobs. I think that we have been working with the skills team on um, on workforce um, data. Um, and so we have got some intelligence about where, where jobs are being advertised. And as you would expect, um, our sector is the one that is, continues track with um, the lowest jobs being advertised um, underneath, you know, from memory, like there is a line and everyone else is creeping back up but not our sector is still below the line. Um, I think that once we know where, when, which organisations haven't got the Cultural Recovery Fund, I think that's when organisations who won't be able to sustain without it will start to make decisions about closure. And then I think um, Councillor Greenhouse is right that the next financial year is going to be the really, really tricky one. Um, I think that that is across every part of our sector. Um, yeah. And, and and 
we'll we'll kind of keep an eye as much as we can but because there are so many different points at which different parts of the sector and different organize and you know talking to organizations some have really healthy reserves some have run their reserves right down to a worrying level it's such a mixed picture like we will try but it, it's it's a tricky one to capture properly can i just come back quickly david is that okay of course, um, yeah just to say that the, the 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 financial year 20 to 21 is also when I think most local authorities as a whole will really really start to to, 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 to struggle which again will that have an impact a, 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 another impact on on the cultural sector um but on on the point about um lobbying and I know that that GM is well on the case for lobbying. I'm just wondering whether we could just add add some value to that as individual local authorities to all write um, and and to to, to 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 the relevant government departments and and do our own lobbying as well, just to make that that voice even more various and hopefully to strengthen the message. It's, it's something I, I, I'm thinking of doing in, in Stockport. Mm. Can I uh, can I just chip in, Chair, on, on, on the point of lobbying? Is that all right? Yes, yeah. Um, I just, Jane again, I, I just wanted to say I'm a member of the LGA Culture, Tourism and Sport Board for the second year running and they have a very strong lobbying function uh, with all of these bodies and often I mean the next meeting is on the 23rd of September and um, outside of this meeting I'm very happy to you know to, to look at ways that we can feed back into their meetings perhaps even take the slides um, if they'll let us uh, because we're in a unique position um, your report says you know the greatest um, the sort of collection of I mean big sorry the greatest collection of resources outside London mm -hmm. is probably in Greater Manchester and I think anything that I can do wearing that hat um, in but in both directions really um, I'm happy to kind of work with you on that um, and and particularly uh, on a coordinated approach to lobbying for Greater Manchester if that's appropriate. I think it's totally appropriate I think uh, I think we have to use every avenue we can to champion GM because it's absolutely right that you know we have we are known for our cultural offer the conurbation is 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 championed for that so absolutely that would be really helpful I know Marie Claire and Alison you'll be in touch um with Jane for that I think that's a, that's a, a wonderful contact I completely agree with Kate I think the more we have um uh, the better it is the more responses going from the boroughs I think where possible if we can get MPs on side as well and they can lobby in Westminster I think the more we get on board uh, uh, with this um and the more we uh, get people to sit up and listen everybody accepts culture um and, and the and the benefits it brings but sadly when we start to talk finance many people start to put culture further down the list We've, we're used to that in a sense we see that happening all the time but we have to highlight how what could be lost here uh if if action is not taken and uh so um i think it's hugely important so so thanks for that kate and jane uh, can i bring in councillor cohen next please Thank you, Chair. The, the, the issues raised are so huge and so complex and really difficult to get your head around and I'm sure no one around this, this meeting has, has ever comprehended anything like this would happen. But I'm a half full person and I'm trying to think of the future and what we can do now. And in the grand scheme of things, it's not much, but I think if we take it back to the core values of Greater Manchester's interest and AGMA, and um, the United We Stream project. We did something similar in Salford uh, with um, some success with um, famous people interjecting from Salford's um, showbiz era, John Cooper Clark and Peter Hook, etc. It worked really well for very low cost. 
It's just an idea of creating a sense of identity for every region that perhaps we should celebrations of Wigan, Stockport, Bury, Bolton on a United Stream basis that feed in to a central resource that we can start celebrating the areas we represent and giving that local population a local input, even if it is just online, but it, it kind of be a, not a diversion, it's just dealing with what the cards we've got, it's something to do, something that would engage people. And the other issue would be, I guess, let people understand how they can connect, because not everyone's au fait with tablets and iPads. If you could explain to people you can connect via YouTube on your channel or TV, or if you could talk, speak to TV organisations and say, can you dedicate a channel for us for Greater Manchester to broadcast a fixed term period? Maybe that's an option to look at moving forward. Thank you. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. So I love that idea. But in, in a sense, we are trying to do a lot of that with the uh, with the Great Place project so that, that when that's um, uh, that's connected with the um, with Shona's. Um, I'm looking at Mary Claire just to give me the proper title of that. But Shona and Nick Bailey's uh, area where they've done videos and uh, social media um, presentations. Uh, and I think there's a whole program established now timetable for each borough to have distinctly their own um, place and their heritage of their place put forward so that so that we are definitely um, moving in that direction so exactly like you say celebrate the identity of places because we all know um, you know we talk here we sit here as a GM we have tremendously individual pride in all our own areas and our residents do we mustn't lose sight of that and the heritage of those areas and uh, so, so I think it's really key that each area has got that identity. And and I think um, I don't know if Mary Claire or, or Alison want to come in on that with just any more detail. Yeah, I think um, so. What we've got in the recovery plan is is a kind of advocacy piece. And if you if you remember back to the um, to the paper where we had two hundred seventy thousand pounds of strategic funds ring fenced. Um, so in the plan, some of that is going to Marketing Manchester to do that advocacy piece um, to kind of to add to resources that they already have. And it will be a kind of campaign based on the individual strengths of districts, um, looking at what people are proud of um, and getting people to move in between districts. I think if you look at tourism, we're unlikely to be welcoming international tourism for a while. I think even national tourism is going to take a while. Um, I think that getting people moving around Greater Manchester is is in the, the mind of kind of marketing Manchester. You know, the people going from Salford to, to Bury and, 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 and seeing the wonderful things that we have on our doorstep, I think. Um, and so there's that. There is plans in the kind of legacy for United We Stream to, to become um, a showcase of talent, of local talent. Um, I think that, that all of that will be kind of worked through, but yeah, definitely something that we are on with. Thanks, Mary Claire. Uh, Janet? Uh, thanks for that, David. Um, some of what I'm going to say has already kind of been covered and yes I am a glass half full person but I'm just going to talk for a moment about some of the worries that I have about audiences and how we've been ignored um, through some of the policies that have been coming through from central government. Hospitality has you know ha has been looked after but the arts sector and culture sector hasn't in my, my opinion. Um, worries about audiences and I think the audiences are still there but how how can we have plain loads of people sitting together for four hours in close proximity but yet still not have people in in our venues enjoying uh, the entertainment whether it be dance music or whatever I just think we need to within our lobbying we need to to stress that other groups of people are coming together um the tour de france for example um there's a lot of stuff going on in sport that we're not being allowed to do in culture and art is my is my kind of point sorry i'm i'm wombling about a bit here but i, I i'm getting quite annoyed about 
people meeting in various places, yet we're still not allowed to meet to listen to music, for example. Um, lobbying, whilst I agree with Kate, it might be useful to separately do something. I, I still think it's stronger if we're all in it together and send a, a, a a, a, a general response, a general lobby to, to the government for that. Um, on funding, I do think that some organisations have been penalised for having reserves. Um, and that's re a real worry to me. You know, I, I, I do understand, yeah, you've already got that, therefore, the, and these people really need it. And sometimes when I've been having discussions with an arts council, the, there were people that were struggling before the pandemic came along. And in some ways, the pandemic has kind of uh, sorted out uh, the survival of the fittest type of, uh, of, of scenario. But uh, I think that some groups have been penalised for having those reserves. And somebody said, you know, they've delved so far into those reserves that they've not got them now uh, they are going to become the next uh, the next round of victims and um from march onwards as you say the next financial year uh, i think that's most of what oh yeah the it and technical divide that became very evident right at the beginning especially with kids and education that, that there's a problem there whilst you know you're accessing um I don't know, a clarinet solo online because you've got the, the facility with your iPad. You can't actually um, you can't actually get some children, some children, some adults could just can't get that access. And then the other one is that working with everybody we're just to announce Dippy will be open on Monday. We've had a <laughs> We've had a bloody dinosaur since since March. Um, we are opening on on Monday, and it's opening in conjunction with with some of the stuff that's going on in our museum. Um, one of the problems that we've had with that, just to say, and I'm sure that everybody else is having the same problems, is a lot of what we did was very hands on, and now it's hands off. So. Um, that, that's one of the things with the museum exhibit. I was talking to Lorraine from the Natural History Museum yesterday um, and uh, they've had to close a couple of their galleries because everything was too hands on and they can't they can't manage to get people in there. But it's really good to see museums uh, and art galleries and libraries opening and I look forward to us being able to do even more of that. Mm. I think you raised some some really valid points there and I think uh, certainly around the reserves um, I don't know we see this happening in, in so many areas don't we where uh, I don't know that uh, there is people who behave responsibly and 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 provision and, and others that that sadly through probably sometimes no fault of their own of course and organizations have have dealt de had to delve into reserves but yeah you're right um they end up being penalised. Uh, we've seen that with um, some local councils, haven't we, where, you know, they've gone, but then suddenly government's gone in there with a shed load of help for them. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. Do we then balance it by that? That organisation is just lost because, you know, we can't give them that that support. It's a, they're all very, very difficult and challenging decisions. Regarding the actual venues opening, I think it's a, a real problem because there is, of course, an area of concern about the safety of performers themselves uh, who will be inhaling and breathing in throughout a whole night on stage, often in very enclosed situations. And this is all the unknown. You know, will they be at higher risk if somebody within that audience is um, symptomatic or is, or is not symptomatic, but is just carrying the virus and that they are in front of a, a very large group of people inhaling the same air that's just circulating in that room. So it, it's, it, it is a really difficult scenario. And of course, because it's a new virus, I mean, it's almost become a cliche, hasn't it? We're still learning. Everyone is still learning and nobody really has the answers. And at some point, we have to, it will all come down, I believe, to measuring risk. And it could be as simple as the risk of closure or the risk of seeing what can be done and can be achieved. So um, it's it's a really difficult one. You, you raised some some key points, which I know we've discussed uh, when when we've met up as a, as a as a group, as an officer group, and 
and just try to to come to terms at how best to and and I think a lot at the end of the day will probably come down to individual um, organizations making those choices themselves certainly the appetite is there and I think once cultural organizations open that we've seen it actually those that have announced uh, I know the Opera House and Palace have uh, certainly given intention to open in March and they've said their pre bookings are, are pretty fantastic so the support for the industry is there it's just creating however we do it that's safe. I mean, good almighty, every time I go to the Palace and Opera House, it's probably one of the most uncomfortable experiences I ever had anyway. So because of those seats. But I mean, even though uh, that takes place, you, you want to have a degree of confidence and safety. And that is about perhaps us developing at GM and lobbying what that means to central government for us of what we we consider a safe an, an environment that gives confidence to people moving back in and perhaps that's um, a piece of work that we should <coughs> start to develop along with our heads of organizations that we meet regularly what does it mean what what does what does a venue opening in january uh, look like uh, if we have a, a certain percentage of the living with the virus still which we inevitably will have um marie claire do you want to come back in on that yeah it's, it's one of those again it's really really interesting I think what we've seen is different ways in which um, venues and um, ticketing organisations are trying to reopen I think um, if we look towards the the winter season um, what we're seeing is a lot of organisations going into um, ways in which they can measure individual risk um, and some of that is testing beforehand. I think there's a big push on testing. There's now 15 minute tests, I think. And one of the things that people are looking at is whether you have that 15 minute test before you go into a venue. And that may be allow. Um, there's other things that, that we're hearing that actually there are some positive noises about a, a vaccine being ready by January. Like there are, so each organisation, and this is like international tour operators as well, we're getting information from, from all around the world around how people are tackling this. And it is just, at the moment, it's going to be one of those kind of wait and sees. I think um, a lot of organisations who can technically open or could technically put some kind of performance on it doesn't financially stack up for them to do so it actually makes more financial sense for them to go dark until they can get back to full operation and I think that again as we've been saying throughout this it's about like individual organizations will have to make different you know a lot of the organizations that we've been speaking to have been talking about how they will be doing a blended program and that will be some physical and some digital. Um, the the monetization of digital content um, is going to be a big thing that needs to be cracked because at the moment it just doesn't make money. Um, people expect it for free. I think that that it's there's there's so many different factors at play. I think individual appetite for risk as audience members. I think some people will be quite happy to go in and take that risk. I think there's also something we need to be really, really cognizant of is that some of the plans that are being made, um, actually, if you are shielding or if you have um, are in a vulnerable category still, then there is going to be a whole swathe of people excluded from live events. And we need to be aware of that and thinking and, and making sure that inequalities that, that already existed pre-pandemic, especially in relation to kind of disabled audiences and audiences with ill health, um, they are, we need to, to be proactive in our support for those audiences and, and disabled performers as well, because um, performers who have disabilities or who would be categorised within the, within the vulnerable group are going to find it more difficult work and I think that all of these things it's I think it was Councillor Cohen who said it's it's huge <laughs> it's huge there's a lot yeah uh, thanks Marie Claire and I, I know Jane has asked uh, when is the deadline for, for the cut for their comments 
to come back to you for the draft response, Marie Claire. So I'm just going to ask Jane, have you have you any comments, Jane? Do you want to come back mm -hmm. on anything? Um, I would rather just have another look at it and do that. It's just good to know that, that there is a bit of an opportunity. Um, if it's the next few days or over the weekend, I'm really happy to send something in fairly quickly. Is that all right, Mary Claire? Is that does that fit the deadlines? Yeah, absolutely. We've got we've got a series of deadlines. Um, I think that that it would be really really good because what we want is by the time the paper gets to the combined authority at the end of September, we want it to be as strong as possible. So there's going to be different iterations going to different groups. Um, so yeah, um, if we could have comment by, I think maybe this time next week and we will work that into future iterations of the paper great thank you right are there any further questions or comments regarding this oh hi this is um zoe williams uh, culture officer from um, manchester hi, zoe. I, just, I was hi yeah sorry um faceless person um i was just going to uh, mention on that last discussion that i think there is a sort of there's a certainly a gm theaters network and i think recently um there's been established a more small um performance theater network as well and just around that discussion about you know so obviously they must be having these conversations about how they're going to reopen and sharing practice so um you know that might be useful um, a useful connection um in terms of that discussion that was that was all and i can find out details of those if marie claire hasn't got them and and um and share them that's great we've got a thumbs up from marie claire so there so that's uh, that would be brilliant thanks zoe okay um councillor cohen Yeah, I posted this before on the actual comment section. It's just a, I just want to emphasize the, uh, the issue of confidence. And I, I've been out perhaps more than I should have been in Manchester and localities of these past several weeks. As soon as it was open, I was out seeing what town was like, Manchester was like. And there's still a lot of people nervous of going out, nervous of eating out, nervous of drinking out. And I just think we have to get a head around the psychological barriers to recovery for people, the general population. And I suggested in the comment section, which isn't my bag, but free public transport for a set period of time to encourage people to travel in Greater Manchester. It's subsidised to an extent anyway. Maybe that's feasible, maybe it's not. But I think we have to put all, all things on the table here. It's just to increase uh, the population's confidence in going out and the, the people will need that sort of support. Cheers. We can certainly uh, put that down, look at it as uh, see how viable that and, and what kind of finances will we'd have to um, involve in that in order to make it happen. Um, yeah, I think there is. I mean, I think we've seen such a mixed picture regarding uh, what we've seen, I think, is we've seen the main probably city centre and town centres um, pretty uh, deserted, yet we've seen many in the suburbs of our towns and the suburbs of our cities actually quite jam-packed and people have stayed very local to where they live. Certainly that's been my experience and certainly um, there is going to be huge implications uh, for the city in a sense because we've, we've seen many major, this is another aspect which links to us tremendously, Many, uh, you know, large organisations based in the city have already told their employees uh, that they will not be coming back before, you know, for the rest of this year. Um, now, the the impact that starts to have on, you know, micro businesses, the coffee shops, the sandwich bars, all those places, including the restaurants, people who used to meet up after work, people who used to go to the theatre after work, you know, and um, I th I think there has to be a degree of um, like you say, bringing some confidence about going back into the large public areas. Uh, but also, we all understand there are great opportunities from, uh, you know, uh, digitalization, working from home. But that has to be balanced with the economic effect that has on businesses that depend upon those employees in certain areas. So it, again, it, it's a massive complex picture um, there's lots of work being done on it. I'm not sure if we've actually reached a, a final answer, 
Um, and also there's a, there's an issue of well-being here as well, you know, for a lot of people. Working from home suits a lot of people. They love it. But there's different environments that people live in where it's a lot easier for somebody if you've got a separate room. It's not so easy if you're in a multi-generational household. It's not as easy if you're dealing, you know, just having to uh, to work uh, in, 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 an, in an inappropriate location for you. There's many people also that the camaraderie of work is their camaraderie in life. Uh, and to actually just a very isolated experience is not for everyone. So there's a lot of conversations I think need to have a lot of businesses to realise just what is the best for their workforce long term. Uh, but again, we all understand um, the, the issues uh, that, uh, you know, the advantages that people have in seeing that moving digitalisation cuts down costs for them. So um, again, that's a very moving um, picture at the moment. So uh, I've got um, a comment from Kate. Thank you, Chair. Just re referring back to um, Councillor um, Cohen's really good report that um, comments about um, confidence. I think that that really extends as well to um, public transport and this takes us it again into that territory where everything is connected to everything else, isn't it? And 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 it, it's huge, it's complex, it's complicated and it's a, it, in in some ways it's um it's a, a a fast moving picture and in others it's a bit kind of ploddy um just from my own personal experience so forgive me the the the, the anecdotal nature of this but um i still do not feel as safe as i'd like to feel getting on a bus and I won't go into all the, all, all, all the reasons for, for that, but I do think there is something more that um, TFGM possibly could do or just the bus operators could do to just help passengers along with that, that sense of, 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 of confidence. After my last bus journey into the centre of Manchester, I vowed I am never getting on a bus again because it was horrendous. More people were um, not wearing face masks than were wearing them. Now that's just one person, one bus journey, but I, w I just wouldn't, I don't know, I'm quite sure that I'm not alone in that and that more needs to be done to actually safely ferry people within the boroughs and also into into the centre. Thanks. Thanks Kate. Um, Janet, Janet, I know you put a comment in, did you just want to just give your view? It was just the novelties one off about working from home. It's a bit <laughs> like it's a bit like when you're poorly at first, it seems really nice that you can stay at home, not not get into your ordinary clothes and, and you can eat when you want and drink when you want, etc. And then eventually you just, just get bored with what, what's happening and, and not meeting people. And the whole thing is that we are human beings and we need people. Mm. And the sooner we can get back to a situation where we can uh, be in the company of people mm. rather than in what appears to be a, as a, somebody described it the other day it's like the Muppets or something like that <laughs> on the screen in your little squares or um, yeah. yeah celebrity celebrity squares remember that one I do yeah, remember where, that where one where you've yeah, got all the people in the boxes and so on we need to get back to to normality and you can use the phrase some kind of normality I'd love to be able to get back to where we were um, it's perhaps never going to be quite the same again and we've we've learned all sorts of lessons but this whole idea about not going back to the office uh, and and companies giving up their offices and, and instructing people to work from home it's great in the warm months but how is it going to be when we've got the heating bills and everything else and I don't know about anybody else but I don't think I've eaten from the dining table in goodness knows how long because it's still set up as a an office yeah, just it, the novelty has worn off. Mm. I mean, I, I suppose we've made tr made tremendous strides. Who would have thought 
we've talked about it for very you know for a long time who would have thought that we'd be carrying out meetings like this in the short time that we actually are able to set them up and that is a positive from this and i know probably like many of you i've had uh, on you know online meetings with people who would have traveled up from london to meet us at our, at our council you know and and we, we then had me to just say why did we never do this before you know this but had to put a whole day away in a diary to come up and see us rather than us just doing a meeting like this so there are those tremendous benefits that we've got from but i think you i think you um say janet what many people feel and many residents feel i think as well that sense how many times have, do we all hear i hear it constantly at the moment to include the position that bolton's in that they just want to get back to some degree of normality and i think this is the next stage really isn't it of the whole living with covid recovery plan in that there you know we have to kind of i don't know what people's views on this it's not really for this forum to to even but it's connected everything's connected as we've just said but we perhaps need to work to a place where there is more of a degree of individual responsibility uh, and that we we allow people to to get back to a degree we've seen the schools go back now seen some majority of businesses not all sadly be, be able to to open and of course not our sector um yet um but but that degree of that sense of normality is is just something that everybody i i believe is is craving for at the moment um are there any more um anybody else want to come in any more comments I think what we've got then is, is you, you hopefully have the report. We'll send it out just in case. Marie Claire, you're going to send out the up to date uh, draft. Brilliant to everyone. And any comments that you have, anything that you think can be added to or that you'd like more clarification on, just get back to Marie Claire. That'll be that'll be fantastic. So that brings us to the end uh, of the meeting. Can I thank you all for your uh, participation? Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, we just moved to the date and times of future meetings and just to say that they'll be organised in accordance with the committee's terms of reference uh, at least twice a year uh, and circulated to members. I'm just going to flag up. I don't want to create extra meetings for anyone, but I think uh, because we live in very strange times, Mary Claire, which perhaps if we get developments, I think it would be good that this committee does meet again just together to be, have their input into it rather than a stick to, to the basics. I want to create extra workload, but I think it would be useful at this time to just get the the feedback from this uh, from this cohort. If that's OK. Yeah, brilliant. OK, so it just leads me to thank you all. Uh, for joining today and hope to see you all again soon and this ends the uh, uh the live recording thank you thank you thanks, thanks david thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye bye bye, -bye.